QSO Today, Episode 397, Ed Wilson, N2XDD. My thanks to ICOM America for sponsoring the QSO Today podcast. Just a reminder that I proudly display on the show notes pages the many benefactors who make QSO Today possible through their sponsorships, donations, and transcriptions. My thanks for their continued support. You too can support QSO Today by following the support links in the show notes pages. Welcome to the QSO Today podcast. I'm Eric Guth, amateur call sign 4Z1UG, where I demonstrate the diversity and relevance of the amateur radio hobby and its impact on society by interviewing ham radio operators, many of whom played vital roles in shaping our technology through the amateur radio hobby. And while many people might say, ham radio, do people still do that? This podcast demonstrates through in-depth interviews just how amazing, diverse, and dynamic the amateur radio hobby continues to be. Ed Wilson, N2XDD, discovered radio as a kid with a gifted four-channel public service safety scanner. This led to an interest in radio, a career in law enforcement, and exposure to amateur radio. Now an active ham, Ed has become a booster of the M17 project, a native ham radio digital mode for VHF and above. NX2DD is my QSO today. N2XDD, this is Eric, 4Z1UG. Are you there, Ed? 4Z1UG, here is November 2, X-Ray Delta Delta. Ed, thanks for joining me on the QSO Today podcast. Can we start at the beginning of your ham radio story? When and how did it start for you? So my journey into radio began at about five years old. Like uh, any other little boy my age, I was fascinated with fire trucks. I was just so lucky to have an uncle that was a firefighter with the FDNY. And he had taken me down to the firehouse quite a number of times to check out the rigs, uh, usually when they were cleaning them on a Saturday uh, morning. So I remember the first time down there, they were dispatched out. And I heard the, uh, the roar of the dispatcher coming over the speakers in his firehouse. And uh, I was like in awe, and he must have saw it on my face. And he said, do you like listening to that? I said, yes. He goes, all right, I have something for you. And uh, he handed me my first radio, which was a five-channel crystal-controlled handheld. And uh, at the time, the Fire Department of New York, FDNY, they only had five frequencies. And there was a crystal for each of the five frequencies. So I'd taken that radio home, and I listened to it pretty much 24 hours a day. And uh, I fell asleep with it on, and uh, I woke up. And if it was off, one of my parents turned it off in the middle of the night, I would turn it back on. And uh, eventually from there, he uh, upgraded me, and he gave me a 10-channel crystal-controlled uh, base scanner. So uh, that lasted me about another two or three years until I got my first real programmable scanner, and that was a Bearcat 142, I believe, with a little uh, LED display on it. So I had a lot of fun with that, and I soon found uh, there were other things to listen to other than the fire department, and uh, I found police frequencies. So I listened to the uh, NYPD frequencies, which was probably 70-plus or so frequencies. And uh, from there, eventually, I found ham radio frequencies, Didn't know who those guys were, but uh, I saw that they were talking about a lot of interesting things. So I would listen to them sometimes and take a break from the uh, chaos of the emergency services that I normally listen to. Okay, so you're doing this as an elementary school kid. What were your friends doing at the same time? Probably more sports, probably Little League and uh, a lot of bike riding. I did ride a bike, but at the same time, I also found computers. I had my first computer probably around age 10, and it was a Commodore 64 that my parents had bought me. So you were kind of a geeky kind of kid. Yes, absolutely. I can relate. Did you have any contemporaries at that time that started to pick up the interest that you had? You weren't doing this alone. No, I was pretty much by myself listening to the radios. Um, None of my friends shared that interest. Although when they did come over, they'd be interested to hear what was going on in the, uh, the local police precinct. But other than uh, going out and buying their own scanners, nobody that I know of. Did you have siblings or do you have siblings? Yes, I have a little sister and two older brothers. And were they interested in what you were doing? Not at all. Did you ever chase any of the calls that you heard on the scanner? So, yes, absolutely. As we got older, um, some of my friends who remembered listening to the radio um, when we were younger, they had gotten their their driver's license before me. So... uh, We would take out my Bearcat 200 XLT, and we'd uh, throw in a a bank of frequencies, local frequencies, and uh, we'd scan them, and we'd drive around and 
go from fire to fire to police call to police call. And were you ever noticed? A couple of times. But the thing was that we noticed was there are a group of people doing the same thing at the same time, which we thought was kind of interesting. And did you find like a social group or club out of these people or were these people operating pretty much independently? There were some independent groups out there. A couple of groups had uh, pager networks that they would use. Eventually, I found out about the pager networks and I subscribed to one of them and uh, it would make it a little bit easier. They tell you all the uh, the large active police and fire jobs going out uh, around New York City. The hometown then was New York City? You were in the middle of, of Manhattan? I lived in Ozone Park, which is part of Queens County, which is one of the five boroughs of New York City. I lived approximately five minutes from John F. Kennedy International Airport. So here you are, this kid, you have an interest in listening. Did you have any interest in shortwave listening, or was everything more local to what was happening on the beat in New York rather than overseas? Yeah, everything was pretty much a local thing. I liked knowing what was going on in the neighborhood. Now, having this interest, did you also have an interest in electronics and building things or wiring things up on your own? No, not at that time. At the time, my interest was radio and computers. I'd sit down in front of the Commodore 64, which was eventually upgraded to a Commodore 128, and I'd open up one of the monthly magazines and I'd start typing in the the programs that were in there. It, It would be like a four or five page pages worth of code to get a small little sprite to dance around on your screen. So I spent hours doing that. And did you upgrade to like cassette tape storage and things like that along the way? I totally skipped the cassette tape and I went right to the Commodore 1541 floppy drive. Which was at the time, I think those were what, five inch floppies, I think. Five and a quarter, I believe, yeah. So I'm getting a sense of the era. What did you discover being a young computer programmer? What world opened up for you? I think that I discovered that pretty much anything was possible with the right amount of knowledge. And I think at that point where I started my journey into gathering information and and becoming an information and knowledge collector, not necessarily something I would use right away, but I'd like the fact that I knew it was there and it was available for me. And I liked having those resources. And when you got to high school, did you have a group of friends that also shared this interest? Were you part of the computer club? Not at all. So my high school career started out, took a little turn from computers, and I went into music. So at the beginning of high school, I guess I was around 14 years old, I had started a mobile DJing business with two of my uh, friends. So there was three 14-year-olds starting a mobile DJ business, and our first paid event was a wedding. That was kind of interesting. You were entrepreneurial at a young age? I was. And you learned about having business partners? Yes. And how did that go? It went pretty good. I had uh, had that business with them for about three or four years, and then we kind of parted ways as friends. And I continued the business with somebody else that I had met in, in college, and I continued that business with him up until uh, I started a new career. So you were a mobile DJ through high school? Yes. You continued to have the interest in computing and computer programming? Yes. At that point, I I, I moved on to the uh, IBM series of computers. Usually at this point, I'd ask you if if you were in ham radio, whether that helped you make the decision in terms of what you would study in college. What did you study in college? I wound up studying criminal justice. That actually seems like that makes a lot of sense if you were listening to public safety all those years. It was a tough decision for me because my DJ business was going pretty good at at that point. And uh, you know, right around the senior year of high school, it was a decision of what I wanted to do when I get older. And uh, I was really enjoying dealing with music, and I figured maybe I will uh, become a communications major in college, and I will venture into some of the recording arts. And uh, I kind of a last-minute decision. I pulled out of that, and I uh, chose a criminal justice path. And where does that path lead? The path leads to me being sworn in as an NYPD police officer in 1997. This is like a beat officer? You actually were out there in the neighborhoods? Yes, I was uh, patrolling in a neighborhood approximately five miles from where I grew up. Are you still doing that? No, I'm retired now. I retired two years ago after doing 23 years. Of police work? Yes, I retired as a detective in summer of 2020. I think you're the first, well, maybe not the first detective I've interviewed in the QSO Today podcast. And what was the best part 
of that job. You sound to me like you're a problem solver and a problem solver. Being a detective seems to me that that would be an ideal problem solving job. Well, my favorite part of the job was no two days are ever alike. So everything was totally different. I couldn't see myself sitting in an office um, waiting for something to happen. I, I liked the fact that we were out there on the street. We were solving problems. We were helping out in the community. And every, every day was an adventure. Did you have a specialty as a detective? I mean, I've never spoken to a New York police detective before, so you'll have to excuse me as part of asking the questions. Do detectives in the New York Police Department, do they change the emphasis of things that they are doing detective work on through their career? Yes. Yeah, I was promoted to the rank of detective upon completing uh, some time in the narcotics unit. So I was doing narcotics investigations for a while and eventually was promoted to detective because of the work I did there. And then after uh, after a while, I became a little bit more involved in some of the technical aspects of the uh, the unit that I was in. So I was helping maintain the equipment that our undercovers used to record different transactions that they were involved in. This is like wireless equipment. Wireless and covert equipment. You're retired, but is there still an opportunity to maintain equipment like that? I'm sure there is. But you're not pursuing it? I'm not pursuing it. I'm enjoying being retired and playing radio again. How did you find your way into ham radio? I mean, obviously, it seems that an interest in scanning and listening to public safety and things like that could lead there. But how did you find your way into the hobby? So during the summer, one of my years in high school, I was working part time at a office building in Manhattan, um, helping with the custodial staff. So I was doing 3 p.m. to 11 p.m. at night, and I had like three or four floors that I was responsible for. So I would take my handheld scanner along with me, and I would scan all the different frequency bands. And I came upon two meters, and I was scanning there one night, and I stumbled upon a net that was called Monitoring Long Island Sounds. And it was a scanner net at the time. And I was fascinated by it, and I needed to get in there, and I needed to join the net. Not being a ham radio operator, I did not have that ability. So at that time, I started investigating what it would take to be a ham radio operator. And at the time, there was still a Morse code requirement, and I just couldn't see myself studying Morse code. But looking back, I think I was just lazy, and I kind of just waved it off. And then uh, a couple short years later, the no-code tech license became available. And that's when I jumped into the ham radio hobby. And how old were you? I was 21 years old. And what was your first call sign? It's the same call sign I have now, November 2, X-ray Delta Delta. Really? Because you went in as a general or extra class? No, no. I went in as a tech. At the time, they were issuing one by three call signs in, in two land for technicians. That's something new. And that probably was the period of time when I was not as involved as I am now. Okay, so you're 21 years old, you have a tech license. What was the first rig that you purchased then? So at the time, I had uh, moved out to the suburbs of New York City, out into uh, Long Island, out in Suffolk County, Long Island. And uh, it's a commuting, it's a commuting suburb. So I spent most of my time in my car. So I got myself a two meter, a Kenwood TM241, two meter only mobile. And my radio time pretty much was just uh, to and from work in the auto every day. And where did you spend that time on two meters? Did you have a favorite network, a favorite repeater? There was a couple different repeaters we would use. I, I became involved with a group of guys that were also commuting. And um, we would follow two different repeaters due to coverage. And uh, on occasions, we go on to Simplex and we have some Simplex chats. Now, were there a lot of hams in the New York Police Department? It's funny because two of the guys that I was that I was talking to on my commute happened to be police officers. And this was prior to me becoming a police officer. And I didn't really know it at first until I told the guys, I said, I'm going to be leaving the group. I'm uh, starting a new job with the NYPD. And uh, both of them were kind of shocked by that. And I guess I was shocked when I found out that they were also cops. And now this message from ICOM America. Now is the time to spice up your ham shack with ICOM's new ID52A handheld portable radio. Now shipping. This radio is perfect for staying in or venturing out and working your favorite VHF and UHF bands this winter season. Did I say that the ICOM ID52A is now shipping? ICOM's newest handheld radio 
is a VHF UHF dual bander with D star and FM dual mode functions. This radio supports conventional FM communications and D star simplex repeater, regional, and worldwide calls over the D-Star Internet Gateway. The ICOM ID52A is the first handheld amateur radio with a full-color 2.3-inch waterfall display and the ability to send photos over D-Star with a connected Android device. Other ID52A features include a wideband receiver with guaranteed range of 144 to 148 MHz and 440 to 450 MHz, it supports VV, UU, VU, and dual DV mode. It has an integrated GPS GLONASS receiver, including grid square locations. Other features include micro SD card slot, micro USB for data transfer and programming and charging, and of course it is IPX7 waterproof in case you drop it. Be sure to check out the new ICOM ID52A at your nearest ham radio dealer along with a full line of amazing ICOM radios. And when you make that ICOM purchase, be sure to tell your dealer that you heard about it here on QSO Today. And now back to our QSO Today. How do New York policemen, how do they receive amateur radio operators? Do they have a perception of amateur radio operators as perhaps a resource, perhaps a hindrance? What is your sense of that? Well, due to the size of New York City compared to some of the smaller areas throughout the United States, the only experience that the NYPD really has with amateur radio operators is pretty much probably during the the New York City Marathon. The New York City Marathon employs a couple of hundred amateurs to help out with communications during that event. Um, As far as having ham radio operators operate in one of the emergency command centers, In New York City, I don't think uh, that would ever happen, just due to the fact of the complexity of the communication system that New York City employs. So there wasn't like a ham radio emergency group in New York City? There are a couple of Aries groups in New York City, but as far as some of the, you know, like I said, throughout the country, you'll hear of hams helping out uh, more on a one-to-one level with small departments. It's not like that in New York City. How many officers are in the New York City Police Department? 34,000 or so, I would say. A small city. Yeah. Yeah, a small city of policemen. That certainly makes sense without kind of opening the robe. Did you find that the communications equipment that the New York City Police Department used at the time, was it pretty sophisticated? Or the fact that you were able to listen to it may mean that it probably wasn't as sophisticated as it is now. The NYPD to this day operates on a UHF T-band. And probably about 99.9% of their 70-plus frequencies are unencrypted. So it's a very easy system to monitor. Do you think that people are more aware if they're able to monitor what's happening in their city? Yes, I think so. I think people enjoy that. And with the advent of things like the Ring doorbell system, where people can subscribe to a group and it'll tell them, everything that's going on within a certain radius of where they live. I think people love that. They love knowing what's going on to a degree, but it also scares the heck out of people to a degree as well. They may have too much information. Correct. I get that. Where I live too, it's kind of like I don't really want to know everything that's happening within a mile of the house here. Some things are better left unknown. Let the professionals deal with that. So how did your ham radio, how did it proceed? Because obviously I'm, you and I are right now are on Skype, but Skype has video now, and I'm looking at a shop that is amazingly well-equipped. I think there's a 3D printer in there too. I think there's a drill press. You have a couple of 3D printers behind me, and both of them need to uh, get fixed up and work. And a fair number of microphones hanging and things like that. So there's a lot of stuff happening in your ham shack. So how did your ham radio enterprise proceed from there what was the next thing that became of interest to you so i got licensed at age 21 um prior to me entering the police department and uh i became involved with the aries group the local aries group which was a lot of fun i enjoyed the the mcom part of the hobby i moved up to become the assistant emergency coordinator of my town and i was able to help out with emergency communications for some of the wildfires that happened in suffolk county in 1995 and 1996 as well as the crash of twa flight 800 which happened in 1996 so i was pretty much most of my ham radio career at that point 
was involved with doing emergency communications. So we helped out doing a lot of the local walks and uh, special Olympic events. We did a lot of those as well, providing communications. And I was pretty active in that until I joined the police department. And then I wound up taking the old ham radio hiatus. And I got out of the hobby for a while. For how long? Uh, Approximately 20 years. I get it. I had the radio in the car, but it didn't mean it got turned on very much, right? Did you still have the radio? I had the radio in the car for a while, and then I took it out of the car. I had my my license plates, my call sign license plates going. I had the antenna on the back of the car. (laughs) And then uh, when when I became a police officer, and I kind of didn't want my identity known through the neighborhood that I was working in. So I kind of removed all of that and pushed ham radio to the side for a while. But that time goes really fast. Yes. Did your children, do they have an interest in ham radio? Not at all. Not at all. And I didn't get back into the hobby until they were well into their late teens. So uh, there was no chance of me getting them at that point. I wanted to talk to you about the M17 project because you talked at the last QSO Today Virtual Ham Expo. You made a presentation on M17. It implies to me perhaps that maybe you kept your hand in computing or maybe when you retired that you decided that you were just going to go in full bore. Tell us, how did that happen? And I'm looking at all of the things that you're interested in, and all those things seem to revolve around an interest in VHF and UHF, but also in the computer interfaces that go with that. So how did that whole thing start, and how did you start into M17? Okay, I'm going to tell you how I got back into the room. Okay. So I was at a a lock-picking class that was given for law enforcement and military personnel. It was a three-day class. I took the class, and uh, one of the guys sitting next to me in the class, we kind of hit it off. We went out to lunch together, and uh, we were just you know, shooting, the, uh, shooting the, the, uh, the crap. And he told me he was a ham radio operator. I said, oh, I happen to be a ham radio. So he was very enthusiastic about it, and uh, his name is Mike, N2SRO. And uh, he kind of – we kept in touch, and he kind of pushing me, pushing me. Oh, you should get back into radio. And I kind of – Moved to the, the the front of my head, and I was like, ah, maybe I'll start getting back into it, seeing what's going on since I've been gone. Fast forward to about a month later, and I was in a training class for work, and uh, that class was given by a ham, and his call sign is N7XVB. His name is Kel. He's from Arizona. So he was talking about some of the antidotes of him playing with radio and fox hunting when he was a kid. I enjoyed fox hunting my first go around in ham radio. We would do it on Sunday evenings. We'd have a a mobile fox hunt. So as soon as he started talking about fox hunting, I pulled out the phone and I started looking up ham radios. And I found that there was a ham fest the next day. So I go to my first ham fest in well over 20 years. And the first, first booth I came into was a gentleman selling DMR radios. And... I had no idea what DMR was because that wasn't a thing when I left the hobby in 1998. So this gentleman, who coincidentally also happened to be a police officer, talked me into buying a DMR radio. And it was the uh, TYT MD2017, which is a big monster of a radio. And one of the reasons I bought it is because it was pretty cheap. I think it was like 120 bucks. And for some reason, I couldn't fathom spending such little amount of money on a handheld radio. I had remembered before I left the hobby, I'd bought a Kenwood, can't think of the model number off the top of my head, but back in 1996, 1997, I paid $350 for a dual band handheld. And here I am buying this new digital mode that I knew nothing about. I bought a DMR handheld for 120 bucks. So uh, I took the radio home and I started messing with it. At the time, I'm just getting back into radio. I don't have anybody nearby that I know that's still a ham radio operator. So I took to the internet and I started watching YouTube videos on how to program DMR. And it was just so, it was a lot going on. I couldn't figure out why I just couldn't put in the frequency and program it and get on this so-called DMR network. So (laughs) it took a lot of reading and a lot of watching YouTube videos for it to finally hit um, and make sense. And the point where it made sense was about 3 a.m. when I wake up from a, a deep sleep. And everything just kind of made sense in my head. The whole programming scheme made sense in my head. I got up. I got out of bed. I went over to the computer, and I was able to make my first DMR code plug. So uh, I I, I dabbled in DMR as my intro back into ham radio. 
but I, I kind of thought it was a little convoluted still. It would just seem like there was a lot of work going on in, in creating these code plugs. So uh, from there, I joined a, a local club, and I quickly realized I was the youngest person in the club. And a lot of the people did not share the same interests as I did. So I started bringing some of my interests to the club and I was able to get deeper and deeper into the hobby. Um, at which point I was watching more and more YouTube videos. I was joining more mailing list groups that were amateur radio related. And then uh, one day I'm looking at a, I don't know if it was a Reddit post, I think. And there was this gentleman in Poland who held up this handheld. And basically it was a whip antenna and two circuit boards that were black electrical tape together. And he was showing off this new handheld and talking about his protocol M17 that he had uh, created. Um, that would be uh, Wojciech SP5 WWP. So I was kind of fascinated by that, the fact that you could build your own handheld. And that was in the back of my mind. I started dabbling around in some of the other ham radio groups online. And uh, at the time, Somebody in the group had mentioned M17. So a bunch of people were talking about the M17 project, and there was some misinformation. And SP5 WWP happened to find out there was a conversation going about uh, around his protocol. So he came in. He corrected everybody. He was a little upset that nobody really knew what they were talking about, and they were butchering his concept. So uh, he kind of got mad. He left the room that we were in. And about a day or two later, I get a message on Facebook Messenger from sp5 wwp um and he started a conversation with me and he started talking to me and found out that i was interested in this project and he invited me to join his group on discord which i uh, i'm sorry his group on irc internet relay chat which i did and uh got to hang out with those guys over there for a while and very interested in what was going on i didn't necessarily understand what was going on i was able to keep up somewhat but i enjoyed the the learning curve um that i had taken upon finding out about m17 so and for your listeners that don't know what m17 is it's an open source digital voice and data protocol that uses a proprietary free codec and that's codec 2 that was created by david rowe and a couple other guys down in australia i want to take a minute to tell you about my favorite podcast the ham radio workbench podcast with george kj6vu and now joined by rod va3on mike va3mw mark n6mts and vince ve6lk every two weeks george and company offer up a status report on the many amateur radio projects on their workbenches and explore projects on their guests workbenches this group is project active and prolific, covering many technical areas of amateur radio. So the next time you want a deep dive into ham radio electronic project building, or to learn about technology, tools, test equipment, construction techniques, and the rest, listen to the Ham Radio Workbench podcast, available on every podcast player and channel. Use the link in this week's show notes page to get to the Ham Radio Workbench podcast directly. And now back to my QSO. Okay, so... For those people that aren't familiar with open source and what that means, can you talk a little bit about some of the protocols that we're using now that are proprietary? You know, if we're going to compare why is M17 interesting to ham radio versus perhaps the other protocols that people are using now to talk on, on the radio. Okay, so just looking at my desk, I'm looking at my Kenwood D74, which is a D-Star radio. So D-Star uses a proprietary codec, um, which is Ambi Plus, I believe. So the Ambi protocol is licensed through DVSI. So when you buy a handheld radio, uh, such as an ICOM or a Kenwood that's using D-Star, a decent portion of the amount that you're paying for the radar is going for the radar for the radio is going for the licensing fee to use that codec. So with the open source codec, there is no licensing fee. Um, everything is transparent. All of the code that's involved with it is transparent. You're able to go in there and tweak it and make it work the way you want it to work and implement it for whatever idea that you may have. Is there some fine print when you buy a, Kenwood radio or that's using an ambi decoder encoder that kind of says that you can't monkey with the software and the protocol around it I'm sure there is deep down in that fine print that nobody reads and then the other issue perhaps is multiple vendors have multiple 
digital protocols, and those protocols aren't necessarily compatible. I guess we've kind of figured out how to do that, and we can talk about that in some of these access points, hotspots that people are using, right? So you can transcode. Software transcoding. What is the advantage then of M17? And maybe you can talk a little bit about, I can see an obvious advantage in that it's open source, but is it made for ham radio? If we're talking about DMR and you were talking about trying to program a code plug, for me, I'd rather have my teeth pulled than making new code plugs for what I'm trying to do. Can you talk a little bit about maybe what the advantages are of something like that for amateur radio versus perhaps a commercial protocol like DMR? So one of the taglines that the M17 team is, has adopted recently is it's made for hams by hams. And we've built a community of open source developers and radio enthusiasts that are building these systems of new digital voice and data systems based on the hackers and experimenters history of ham radio. So we're taking any information that the community might give us and we're exploring it seeing if it's something that's going to make the protocol and the implementations of it easier to use in the long run. And this community is built by a lot of smart people from around the world. It's a, it's a global community. We have people like uh, Jonathan Naylor, G4KLX, who's been a guest of your show before. And uh, he's come on as one of the, the software developers for the team. And he's helped implement M17 into um, MMDVM. He's written an MMDVM client for M17. Uh, we have other people like um, like Rob, WX90, who is the proprietor of MobiLink TNC devices. So he has these tiny little TNC devices that you can hook up to a Biofang radio, and you can use APRS on a $35 radio. But also, he has some experimental firmware for this TNC3 that you could upload into the TNC, and you can use it for an M17 um, portable unit with the right uh, knowledge. And er every everything's documented out there. We have uh, our community meets on the, a Discord server. So uh, it's pretty much like a, a big gathering of, of nerds, uh, like-minded individuals that are fascinated by the whole open source concept of M17. And we'll sit there and, and we'll spitball some ideas of uh, how we can make M17 better or some sort of a an addition to the the protocol that needs to get done or tweaked. Is it defined well enough yet that you can actually say, well, this is how we determine the channel? I mean, it's channelized communications, I'm assuming. Yes. There is a M17 specification, which can be found on from our website. You can get all the information on, on the spec so far. And you can go in there and you can see the whole entirety of it. We're having an audio conversation, so someone driving to work who are listening to us, I'm hoping that you can explain a little bit. If I'm thinking about DMR, for example, I'm thinking I've got you know the A side and the B side. So on a single repeater, I can actually have two simultaneous conversations. I go into talk groups. Those talk groups on the A side or the B side could allow me to connect to something on the other side of the planet or just through the repeater. How does M17, how does that look? to somebody that wants to set up a radio and either talk on the network. And what does that mean? Is the network a, a party line across the world or what does it look like? Okay. So for those of your listeners that are familiar with D-Star, D-Star is based on a reflector system. M17 has a reflector system. The main M17 reflector that the team uses is M17 hyphen M17. That would be our reflector. It's the M17 system. The name of our reflector is M17. There are well over 200 reflectors now, I believe, in our system, which more coming on uh, every day. So a reflector would be like, humor me for a minute, might be like an all-star hub designed for hub communications. It's a destination that you connect to, and everyone connects to that in order to have that conversation, right? Correct. It's similar to DMR has talk groups and Yesu Fusion uses rooms. So it's just the, yes, it's the destination. It's I get the impression with a talk group, a DSR talk group, we're not meeting anywhere. I mean, it's kind of like, for some reason, we've all opened up this common, maybe it's just the way that I picture it in my brain. But for some reason, it seems like a DMR talk group isn't sitting in the middle of some server. It's essentially like a name server, like a DNS server that says, oh, everybody is you know, here. 
at this moment. And then when that talk group goes away, when it comes up again, it might be someplace else. Does that make sense? Well, in the DMR world, I guess Brandmeister would be the, the largest and more familiar of the the networks that are out there for for the users. So, yeah, I guess the talk group is residing within the… In Brandmeister, yeah, okay. Right. So Brandmeister could be hosting a whole bunch of simultaneous talk groups. Correct. Whereas M17, I could put an M17 reflector in a dedicated computer, a Raspberry Pi. Yeah, you, you can host your own reflector on a Raspberry Pi. And how do we program that? Are you guys going to make it much easier than the code plug thing that we go through? One of the early um, team members to join M17 is uh, Tom, N7TAE. And Tom has some background in working with reflectors with, I can't think of the name, I'm going to get it to you later on, but uh, the XLX reflector system. So Tom was one of the creators of that. So Tom had uh, used some of that magic and made his XLX system compatible with M17. Actually wrote a new reflector system just for M17. And the talk lately is changing the way that the reflector system works. There are a lot of details within the destination call signs that are trying to get worked out. And um, again, this is part of the community. There was an issue in the community saying that the the reflector system might have been a little bit uh, not as easy to navigate as we liked. So we'd started a, uh, a talk recently, I think within the last two or three days. So now we're spitballing a bunch of information on our Discord server, which is open for anybody to come and see, um, come and join in or come and just you know view from the sidelines what's going out, uh, what's going on there and how uh, things are changed in an open source system. If you're driving and you've got an M17 transceiver, do you see that as the way that a person would go from one reflector to the other would be with a channel knob on preset channels? Or would we use uh, like a DTMF 12-button keypad and key in what we wanted in order to get there? Or is it a combination of both? What do you think that the user experience will look like? So the beautiful thing about M17 being an open source project is you're free to implement it whichever way you want. One of the members of our community, Pedro M0IEI, he came up with a little board that he calls the OPI M17, uh, OPI standing for Orange Pi, which is an alternative to the Raspberry Pi. And uh, he came up with this little circuit board that he has hooked up. You're holding up a board to the camera, yeah? I'm holding it. I'll try and get you some pictures we can add. Um, so basically with this little board, it's a hat for the orange pie. It plugs in to a Kenwood RJ45 type of microphone. You would use a USB connection to an MMDVM board, like the little hotspot boards. And you could use Jonathan Naylor's M17 client on this little board. There's a next in display that's on there, a little touchscreen display, and you'll be able to scroll through the reflectors by just touching the little two-inch display. That's attached to it. I'm a kind of guy that when I'm driving, I want a knob that goes click, 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 click. We got that covered. Rotary encoder. We got that covered. So the uh, M17 project, we've been working very close with another open source project called OpenRTX. OpenRTX is a project based out of Italy. Um, three or four guys over there that are designing custom firmware for some of the cheaper Chinese branded radios like the TYT MD380 radio, which is a $99 DMR radio. So uh, they kind of deconstructed that whole radio and uh, pulled out the firmware, saw how it, how it worked. They're writing custom firmware for it. And one of the implementations of that firmware is it'll be able to run M17 on a slightly modified hardware modification done to the MD380. Um, you'll be able to run M17 and DMR on the same $99 radio. Um, the modifications, not for the faint of heart. You do have to do, <laughs> you do have to do some soldering. It's really not that bad, and it's a ninety-nine dollar radio that you're sacrificing. And will it still look like a ninety-nine dollar radio when it's all done? Yeah, the modification's an internal modification. Oh, it's an internal. Okay, so it's not like I've got this orange pie, you know, black tape to the back of this no. radio battery pack on my belt to run the whole thing. It's an internal modification. Uh, you get the modification done. You're adding a resistor to it, and you're running a lead from 
one of the MCU chips to the DMR decoding chip in there. So there's a lot of fine soldering that has to get done, but it's really not too bad. And it's fully documented on their website. The link will be in the show notes for that as well. So how far along is the M17 project to being able to attract a larger user community? Well, it depends on what that, that user – how far that user wants to get involved because right now you can download it. He just wants to talk on the radio. You can get on right now with downloading an app to your cell phone. It might not be what the purest ham radio operators want to see because you're operating on a cell phone. And I'm talking about using the DroidStar client, which is a an app for Android and iPhone users. So right now, that app is the the only is the quickest way to get onto M17. M17 is the only digital voice protocol that's supported upon installation of the app. Nothing else has to get done. No separate codecs have to be added to it. You can just download it and get onto M17. So if you have an Android phone or iPhone, oh really? It'll run iPhone. With, I'm not an iPhone user, but there's a separate iPhone program that you have to run the Droid Star app in Test Flight. Does Test Flight make sense to you, Eric? I think it's called Test Flight. Do you have to break the phone in order to put Test Flight in? I do not think so. I will look that up and put that in the show notes page for people. This is very exciting for me because I love it when people are pushing the envelope. I also love it when people say that the amateur radio purists, I mean, how many of those are there anymore? There's still a few. We become a group of people, at least, you know, who are pushing the envelope of what purist really means. Okay, well, that's very exciting. How about a network radio? Can you explain what a network radio is and whether that will work on M17? So there are some talks with the OpenRTX guys about exploring some of the network radios. I think the Enrico, I have one here, the T320, I believe. Right, so a network radio is actually an LTE push-to-talk portable that runs, I'm assuming it's running Android operating system yes i've looked at those you know for traveling around i do have echo link running on my on my network radio and i do have an older version of um droid star running on here as well does it seem to perform pretty well yeah it's it's functioning one of the other th- we had just recently come back from the orlando hamcation in february m17 we had a table there and we had some of our uh some of our sample uh, units on display. And one of the things we did, we took an old Android cell phone that was running in airplane mode, and we had hooked an OTG cable to the bottom of it. On the OTG cable, we plugged in a USB MMDVM stick. We were using the Zoom Spot sticks. We had two of those set up, and we were talking over M17. We were talking M17 over RF for a distance of about a block and a half. So it was probably pushing out oh probably about a quarter of a watt maybe less and we were and we were using the old android as the rf deck for the uh for the transmission we will return to our guests in just a moment a new way to show your support of the qso today podcast is to buy me a coffee i consume gallons of coffee to create this weekly podcast invite me for coffee by pushing the yellow button buy me a coffee on the qso today show notes page And now back to our QSO today. Are you guys talking to any of the ham radio manufacturers or radio manufacturers about creating real live gear that runs M17? Well, the problem that we foresee is not all the manufacturers are going to be interested in it because of the open sourceness of the the project. They don't really have anything to gain money-wise by throwing M17 into one of the radios. The... Open RTX guys, they were approached by one of the Chinese manufacturers about possibly including their firmware into one of their forthcoming radios. But there's a lot of logistics that need to be worked out with that. We had also spoken to Bob from RFinder when we were down in Orlando. We spoke to him and uh, a couple of his developers. And we're going to see about uh, the feasibility of getting M17 into one of his RFinder DMR uh, telephone handsets. And that makes sense. Essentially, he's running an Android phone with a radio. Yeah, and the projects like this are are just bringing so many people out of the woodwork with all these great ideas, and a lot of them really are feasible with with the right mindset and the right 
hive of people behind you. So if you were going to make a wide area M17 repeater, would you use an MMDVM or something like that as the controller for the radios? That's correct. We actually have a couple of uh, MMDVM modem boards that we had purchased from Repeater Builder. We have two repeaters that we're just getting on the air that's going to be able to uh, to run M17 through the MMDVM modems. And that means that if I want to talk on a reflector using MMDVM on a wide area repeater, can I talk on one reflector and someone else can talk on another? Maybe not at the same time, but... I'm not sure how that how the channeling um, is working on that. That's a little bit beyond my pay grade. Okay. This is probably one of the reasons I'm not such a great fan of DMR is is that I could be talking on a talk group on the B channel and somebody else comes in Jerusalem on the B channel and talks on a different talk group and all of a sudden I find I'm no longer talking to the people I was talking to before. I figure out that there must be somebody else in Jerusalem that's on the B channel doing something else, but all of a sudden I'm just finding that my conversation disappeared. And this is kind of the nature of the beast, I guess, in a dispatch situation. I mean, if I was a trucking company or something, that that seems to make sense. But if you're having a QSO with somebody across the world and all of a sudden they're gone or you're gone, that seems to be disconcerting. And so therefore I thought, are you guys considering how that user experience might play out on a wide area repeater or a city repeater? So we currently have a repeater on the air in Poland. And right now it's basically just beaking out some weather information right now because there's not too many uh, other uses of M17 in Poland. But we're trying to work out all the kinks by just having that there. And again, we rely on our community that's out there and, and they're experimenting and they have ideas. So we're, we're taking all that information and we're gathering it. So at the end, we'll have a reliable system for ham radio operators built by ham radio operators. How much of your ham radio time is spent on M17? Oh, <laughs> I, I spend quite a number of time. I'm, uh, I'm the community manager for the M17 program. So one of my responsibilities is I'm the moderator of our Discord channel. So I'm pretty much in there five, six, eight, ten hours a day, depending on my day, just uh, checking up on everything, taking notes, and making sure everything is running smooth. I see from your QRZ page that you're building an IRLP node, that you are on All-Star. So you like all of these VHF, UHF communication modes. Yes. Are you actually active on all of these now, including Echolink? Going back to how I started my career, I started as a listener. I started listening. So I do a lot of my time listening. Um, I will join in on our uh, a lot of the local nets in the area, uh, my local club nets. I just started playing with IRLP recently. So I, I, I do a lot more listening. I'm the net controller for the M17 weekly net, which uh, we do every Friday at 1700 hours UTC. I am involved with our local Aries group. I am once again the assistant emergency coordinator, so I help out with the net over there. I am a member of our local CERT team. I'm the radio officer for those guys, and I recently became a instructor for them. So as soon as our next CERT class goes in, I will be helping out with the instruction of our newest class. Now, I understand that the Zoom spot, I think, and maybe MMDVM, if I'm right, they also do POXAG paging. And I noticed that, you know, the fact is we have the video open, and I'm sitting here looking at Ed's shack, and I see some pagers hanging from the uh, wall there. Yeah, I have a couple of pagers here. And how are you using those pagers? I like to think of myself as more of a proof of concept ham for uh, for a lot of things. I, I I became fascinated with pox egging technology back in the 90s. I, I had a beeper up until probably late 1999, and I was always fascinated by it. And uh, getting back into ham radio, I saw that you can do pox egg over the uh, MMDVMs using Pystar. So uh, I went out and I got myself a pager and uh, tweaked it up and played around with it with a little bit. And it's probably been sitting back here ever since. So you could carry the pager around the house. I can. I can't imagine there's any wide area ham radio paging at this point anymore. Not here in the United States, but there's a large group in Germany. It's the DAPnet program. And those guys have a wide area paging network in Germany. You know, with smartphones and everything else, it seems like that's kind of a step backwards on the one hand. On the other hand, we were talking before 
we started that you were listening to the episode that I just did with Robin Critchell, WA6CDR, where we're talking about amateur radio networks surviving a big catastrophe. Do you see in the deployment of M17, perhaps that there could be a poxag element to these networks that maybe hams are once again involved in the wide area aspect of communications? I think with M17, anything is possible. Um, it's something that myself and one of the other team members, Steve, KC1AWV, we had uh, tossed around a little bit about playing with uh, M17 over Poxag. So it's definitely a possibility, something that we will be uh, exploring in the future. Um, we have played with APRS over M17 before, which was uh, pretty interesting. And that's uh, something else that's going to get explored more and more. But the... The great thing about this project is there's whatever you can imagine can pretty much get done with M17. We've had some people talking to us about putting M17 uh, up on a satellite. So that's something that we're going to uh, explore a little bit. And Well, there's some stuff going in the background that I can't really uh, talk about right now. Do you think it's a modulation scheme, if I'm even categorizing it correctly, that could be used on HF? Does it use a lot of bandwidth? It does use, we're 6 kilohertz. So free DV on HF uses codec 2, which is the same codec that um, M17 is using on VHF, UHF, and gigahertz. So uh, the free DV guys are doing a great job down there on uh, HF. So we're going to let them stay down there and do their thing and keep rocking on. Where UHF, VHF, and gigahertz is what we're aiming for. Can you see any merger of HF to VHF, UHF networks? I mean, does that seem at all like that could be a possibility? It's nothing we've talked about or really have thought about exploring at this point. What do you think the greatest challenge is facing amateur radio now from your standpoint? There are still a lot of old school radio operators who are refusing to embrace the future of radio. And I think that limits them to uh, to some of the advancements that we have seen. So I, I, I think we need to somehow open up the eyes of some of the, I don't want to say old timers, but some of the old timers to realize that radio has evolved a lot in just the last 20 years alone. You know, just like it took a while for the old AM enthusiasts to embrace single sideband, it's taking some of the single sideband operators a long time to embrace some of these newer digital modes that are out here. But the great thing is projects like M17 and OpenRTX, we're attracting a great number of people that are coming from the hacker and maker communities. A lot of the younger guys out there that have grown up on computers and they uh, speak Linux as a first language and English as a second language. So a lot of these uh, younger groups are already ham radio operators and they enjoy the whole experimenting part of M17 and open RTX and similar projects. So I think it's definitely attracting the future generation of radio. You were mentioning earlier in our conversation that you joined an amateur radio club and that you were bringing to the club perhaps some new ideas and new technology to these potentially old timers. I got a sense that there was a, quite an age difference. How was that received? Pretty good. Pretty good. So one of the first projects I did with them was um, I decided we were going to build a tape measure Yagi for uh, for two meters. So we put together, we cobbled together a Yagi built out of PVC pipe and the metal from a, uh, a standard tape measure. And we spent a couple nights building that. And then the following weekend, I uh, took them out to a local park and I hid a fox and uh, we did a quick uh, fox hunt with them, a on-foot fox hunt. So uh, I have a couple of pictures of a bunch of the old-timers in the group out there with these Yagis uh, trekking through the uh, the brush to find the hidden transmitter. This was a group of guys that probably had spent 50 years on 20 meters. And they were out there. That was something they'd done before. Nothing that they've done before. It was a lot of older ham radio operators, but it was also a lot of newer hams that just happened to be into the older age bracket as well. And so therefore, you think that a project like M17 is really this bait that could be used to bring younger people into amateur radio. How do you find them? Or how do they find M17 in order to find ham radio? What can you guys be doing or what are you doing to actually kind of open that up to the maker community? So uh, 
I like to say that M17 is the new era of homebrewing. You know, we're not necessarily winding our own coils anymore, but we're downloading firmware from a radio and we're tweaking the firmware and re-uploading it and, you know, writing uh, Linux commands to control the radio. We're out there. There's been a lot of publicity in the last year on M17 and the buzzword that seems to get everybody coming over to the group is open source. The whole open source aspect of the project is what's drawing in a lot of the uh, the younger the younger members. And uh, we're out there. We're on Reddit. We're on our Discord. We've been interviewed on most of all the larger YouTube YouTubers channels. We just had an interview last night as well. We have another one lined up for the next week or two. Um, so. The younger kids are watching the YouTube videos, and that's how they're getting a lot of their ham radio education is through YouTube. So they're seeing the project um, being spotlighted on on these programs, and and they're they're finding us. They're following us on Twitter, and they're coming over to our Discord channel. And um, we're going we're going out to two hacker conventions this summer to display some of some of the radios that we have and some of the modifications to some of the hardware out there. And we're hoping that that's going to draw some more, um, some more people into, into the project. We're going to the hope conference, which stands for hackers on planet earth. And that is put on by the 2600 hacker magazine. Um, I'm really looking forward to that one because that one's being held for the first time. Um, it's at a new venue and the venue happens to be where, uh, where I went to uh, college. It's at my alma mater. And, uh, also happens to be where I grew up because both of my parents worked at the university. So I'm, I'm looking forward to uh, going there and we're doing a presentation at that. And then uh, that's in July. And then in August, we're going out to Las Vegas and we'll be at DEF CON. You'll meet a lot of hams there at DEF CON. Yeah. So I'm looking forward to that. And I'm looking forward to, uh, to meeting some of the people that we dealt with uh, only online in person. And you'll have a chance to actually, I'm told this, that you'll have a chance for your hardware and software to really get tested there at DEF CON. Yeah. Whether you want it tested or not. It's kind of interesting. We're talking about a collaboration between uh, three separate villages at DEF CON and uh, the Hardware Hacking Village, where uh, you'd have the opportunity to hack the MD380 and do the modification. We're going to, from that point, do a collaboration with the ham radio and and radio frequency villages to actually... Uh, you know, uh, upload the uh, the new firmware into the radio and, and actually communicate and uh, have your first uh, QSO over M17. So uh, hopefully everything works out and we're able to uh, get that completed. Well, it sounds to me like you could have a lot of brain power automatically in a very short time thrown at this problem. Maybe they'll solve some problems at the same time. Yeah, uh, really looking forward to it. We'll be uh, traveling out there with uh, one of your former guests, uh, Michelle. Sure. W five W five N Y V. So uh, she's become the uh, the mentor to our project. She's uh, she's helped us out a lot with a lot of the uh, the logistics of the project. Then I know it's in good hands. Yeah, I often refer to Michelle uh, for advice. For uh, I'm the vice president of the local radio club, and so I'm usually going to her for some advice and handling some of the situations that might arise in the in the club situations. What advice would you give to newer returning hams to the hobby? Join a club. Definitely join a club. Um, go out there and shop around. Find a club that, that fits your needs. Um, and if you have to settle for if there's only one local club to you, bring your ideas out there. If there's something that you want to dabble with that the club might not be into, throw it out there as an idea. And I'm sure there's somebody else out there that has the, uh, the same desire to uh, do some experimenting that you want to do. So you'd be surprised that you uh, – it might not seem like you're in the right club, but you will find uh, a bunch of like-minded individuals once you, uh, you know, start sharing what you want to do and what you need help with. Well, I can tell you as a person that likes to throw new ideas out there that the chorus of naysayers is often loud, but it usually is overwhelmed by the number of people that will say, you know, that's worth considering. That's an interesting idea. So I think that's great advice. And I haven't heard it before. So, Ed, you're the first one that kind of made me think about this. But you could actually bring an old club back to life by bringing in some new ideas. 
So the radio club I'm involved in is the Suffolk County Radio Club. Um, we're celebrating 75 years uh, next month. We're celebrating our 75th anniversary, which uh, I think is a pretty, uh, pretty neat milestone. We're the uh, oldest club on Long Island. We may not be the largest club, but we are the lo- oldest club. So uh, when I joined the club, there was only about 20 members of the club. And uh, I joined the club a year later. I became the club vice president. We were up to about 80 members prior to COVID. And then last year and this year, we're somewhere around 40. So uh, at least double the, the club membership in the few years that I've been bo- involved with it. So also uh, was afforded the opportunity to start a new radio club. Um, I was approached by the Tesla Science Center. That's Nikolai Tesla, not the uh, electric car guy. So uh, Nikolai Tesla, he had a laboratory out here on Long Island uh, called Wardenclyffe where he did a lot of experimenting with his uh, wireless power technologies. His lab was abandoned for quite a number of years, and it was slated to be sold and destroyed. There was a crowdfunding um, opportunity, and uh, the lab was bought probably about 10 years ago, and it's in the process of uh, being restored, uh, having a museum and a visitor center there. And I was approached about starting a radio club at the uh, the Tesla site, so uh, that's another project that's on my that that's on my plate, and I'm really looking forward to that. When you've got that, that will have to be a presentation at the QSO Today Virtual Ham Expo. Absolutely, I think everyone would love to see how that turns out. Ed, I want to thank you so much for joining me on the QSO Today podcast. This was a lot of fun, and I really appreciate learning more about M17 more than I learned just from your presentation that you made at the expo. So, thank you so much, and 73. 73, Eric. Thank you for having me. That concludes this episode of QSO Today. I hope that you enjoyed this QSO with Ed. Please be sure to check out the show notes that include links and information about the topics that we discussed. Go to www.qsotoday.com and put an N to XDD in the search box at the top of the page. My thanks to ICOM America for its support of the QSO Today podcast. Please show your support of ICOM America by clicking on their banner in the show notes pages. You may notice that some of the episodes are transcribed into written text. If you'd like to sponsor this or any other episode into written text, please contact me. Support the QSO Today podcast by first joining the QSO Today email list by pressing the subscribe buttons on the show notes pages. I will not spam you or share your email address with anyone. Become a listener sponsor monthly or annually by clicking on the sponsor buttons on the show notes pages or use my Amazon link before shopping at Amazon. Amazon gives me a small commission on your purchases while at the same time protecting your privacy. I'm grateful for any way that you show appreciation and support. It makes a big difference as I head towards episode 400. QSO Today is now available in the iHeart, Radio, Spotify, YouTube, and a bunch of other online audio services, including the iTunes Store. Look on the right side of the show notes pages for a listing of these services. You can use the Amazon Echo and say, Alicia, play the QSO Today podcast from TuneIn. My thanks to Ben Bresky, who edits every single show and allows both this host and my guest to sound brilliant. Thanks, Ben. Until next time, this is Eric, 4 z one ug 73. The QSO Today podcast is a product of KEG Media Inc., who is solely responsible for its content.